God, thank you for you and who you are. We would like to experience you in your presence this morning, Lord, so we invite you in. Thank you that you meet us wherever we're at. We want to sing some songs to you right now, God. Amen. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of ages. Oh, come, let us adore. Again, oh come all you faithful. Oh come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh come ye, oh come ye to Bethlehem. Yeah, we need you like the future. 
in Advent leading up to Christmas. We have prepared a booklet available in the lobby that will help you participate at home if you'd like to. Advent means coming and in this season we prepare for the coming of Christ. We are reminded of the gifts Jesus brings to the world as we light the candle of the Advent wreath. The first week we lit the candle of hope. Today we light the candle of peace. Christ brought peace to the world when he first came to us and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and through him, peace is found. Thank you, God, for the peace you give us. We ask that as we wait for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today today to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your peace with each other. We ask it in the name of one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Oh, 
when you come to bring peace, to be in love, to be nearer to us when you come to bring life, to be in love, to shine brighter in us so we might. Yeah. 
us and we can trust in that and trust in you. We love your presence. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, give somebody a high five. Grab a seat if you'd like. Say howdy. Good morning, church. Wow, you guys are so festive this morning. I love it. Merry Christmas to you, too. Awesome. So I am Brandy Epikin. Um, if this is your first time here to the Ann Arbor Vineyard, we're so glad that you came to join us this morning. You're in for a treat. We'd like to offer a special welcome to every newcomer here and another welcome to everybody who's been here before. Um, here are some things you might find helpful. First, we have a welcome booklet that's available at the welcome station near the front doors of the church. It talks about the church's vision and values, and it'll help you get to know us better. After the sermon, we'll take an offering. If you're here for the first time, please look in the back seat in the front of you for the guest info card. It looks like this. Um, if you would like to write down some information, anything that you're willing to share with us, this will help us welcome you in a more personal way. If you bring your filled out welcome card to the welcome station in the lobby, we'll give you a Starbucks gift card so that you can enjoy some coffee or some tea or some soda. Um, you can also place it in the offering bag if you'd like to receive an English or a Spanish CD or MP3 download of worship music from the vineyard. Along with the welcome card, you'll notice a giving card and a prayer card. And this will provide you on um, information of how you'd like to um, give to the church. Uh, there's online options as well. This allows you to make prayer requests or to offer thanks to God for some blessings. And each week, our staff prays for these requests at the staff meeting. Place any or all of these cards in the offering bags as they're passed after the sermon. Now we're going to take a moment to highlight a few of our upcoming events. More details are on the bulletin, so you be sure to check there for more information. Baptisms at the Vineyard. During the closing worship today, we <laughs> will be doing the baptisms. And we are a community that believe that the Spirit moves in lots of ways. And if anyone feels like being baptized is something that you would like to do today, we'll have some spare clothes and towels for anyone who'd like to participate at the last minute. So just look for Nigel Berry if you're interested. He's our youth director with that epic beard. It's epic. <laughs> so let's do lunch today. If you don't have plans after service today, why not do lunch with us? We have four fantastic congregants who will be heading to four fantastic restaurants in our area, and you are invited. Just look for some smiling, hungry-looking groups in the lobby after the service and go and get your grub on. Ryan is headed to Chipotle. Tamika is dominating pyology. Ainsley will be conquering Noodles and & Company. And Sue is tackling the Red Robin. If you join Sue, she recommends the Freckled Lemonade. Hmm. The craft sale, the cashmere craft sale, is also happening. Once again, we're selling beautiful hand-painted paper mache and hand-carved wood crafts from Kashmir, India. These make wonderful gifts, and all the proceeds go to help support Manzoor Haji, a Christian artesian and pastor in Kashmir, India. Items will be for sale each Sunday from November 29th through December 20th. Advent at the Vineyard. We're in Advent season right now, and the church has lots of stuff happening to help you engage and grow in this important season. You can sign up for emails on the website or in the lobby. 
Oh, a quick side note. We wanted to mention that there are occasional video links in the email. So if you have been getting those, just make sure you click on the videos towards the top of the email and you'll get a full experience. The cookie exchange. Man, we have a lot going on. This is awesome. The cookie exchange. Join us next Sunday for cookie exchange and holiday shopping immediately following the service in the cafe and the gallery. Bring two dozen cookies to exchange plus one dozen extra for those who are in an internal uh, war with gluten. <laughs> so I actually just read that wrong. So bring two, <laughs> bring two dozen, like I can't read. Okay, so bring two dozen cookies to exchange plus one dozen extra just to share. Okay. So um, there will also be a gluten-free cookie exchange for those who are in an internal war with gluten. All right. Sign up in the lobby and let us know what cookies you plan to bring and whether or not they are gluten-free. If you have questions, contact L Lindsay Balazar at lindsay.balazar at annarborvineyard.org. The Rotating Shelter. Yes. Our church will be working in partnership with the Shelter Association of Washtenaw County to provide shelter for up to 25 of our homeless communities men, com I'm sorry, um, homeless men during the cold winter months. We're looking for volunteers that will provide food donations. So if you'd like to sign up in the lobby after the service or email the homeless ministries at annarborvineyard.org for more information. Name tags. Finally, we serve a God that knows us by our name, and we desire to be a community where we know the names of one another. Towards that end, name tags are available at the front of each section of chairs. If you are seated toward the front of a section, we invite you to kindly select a name tag from the nearest envelope beneath your seat and pass them back. We have a couple places you can go if you have vocal children in the celebration. We have a cry room over here to my right, your left, which is exclusively for moms and kids. The lobby is available for moms and dads, and the sermon is broadcast in both locations so you can still hear and see. There is no junior high ministry this morning, and the fifth and eighth grade students are invited to remain in service this morning to celebrate baptism with the community. Please turn your cell phones and pagers to silent. As Pastor Donnell makes his way to the stage, please take a moment to stretch out, give a high five or a fist bump to a neighbor, and grab a sermon note from the cart on the floor. We'll also have some coloring pages. What do you say? Oh, yeah, grab a Bible, too. We'll have some coloring pages for those who may be feeling artistically inspired this morning by the sermon. And here is Pastor Donnell. Thanks, Brandy. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you this morning, and it's Baptism Sunday, as Brandy uh, noted, and I just want to give an extra note on uh, getting spontaneously baptized today, because uh, you may have uh, decided uh, you didn't want to do it, and now you're here, and you're like, well, I didn't bring clothes, so you've put all these things in place to prevent you. And I just want to say that um, just be open to the Spirit moving, and if the Spirit does invite you to get baptized this morning, uh, we have clothes for you and towels for you, and we have loving folks who will pray and bless you during the celebration. So uh, I may come back to that in a little bit. I'm going to do my uh, normal opening piece, so just bear with me, which is just wanting to welcome you all and say good morning again. I'm so glad. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning, whether this is your 100th time or this is your first time, whether you are here this morning because you were invited or because you already know the way, we are grateful for your presence with us. We pray for you before the celebration. We pray for you during the week. And our simple prayer for you this morning is that you would experience welcome, that you would experience acceptance, and that you would experience space to have an encounter with the living presence of the loving God. This morning, I'm continuing in our Advent sermon series that Anna Hilliker, our formation and care uh, associate, uh, got started for us last week. And our theme for Advent, Advent already has its own theme, but we added an extra theme to it this year, and it's on forgiveness. 
Today is the second Sunday, as you learned uh, from Shasha and Sabrina, two S's who led us in our Advent uh, wreath candle lighting uh, ceremony. It's the second Sunday, and the theme this week is on peace. In Advent, for those of us who are liturgically challenged, mostly for me, so I write this in to remind me, it's a part of the liturgical calendar where Christians all around the world set aside the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve to prepare ourselves to receive the themes of new hope, new peace, new joy, and new love. Come to us as Emmanuel, God with us. So as we journey together this Advent season, we want to create space for inspection, for reflection, and for repentance. Anna talked about Advent also being a season of penitence or repentance, which we don't tend to want to think about as we go into the Christmas season, but it's an opportunity for us to lay aside those things that may hinder us from connecting with God. Because what we want to do during this season is we want to create new habits and practices which cultivate new awareness of God's loving, reconciling, restoring presence and his action, his action in our past and our present and the action yet to come, which is in our future, in our lives, the work that he's doing to draw us closer to himself. So like I said, last week, Anna Hilliker got us started by asking us to activate hope through vulnerability. And so as we continue our journey together, what I want to do is I want to talk this morning about peace, the peace that we experience as we move towards forgiveness. St. Paul, the Reformed New Testament church planter, and I call him a Reformed New Testament church planter because he spent his early life as Saul of Tarsus, and he went around persecuting, attacking, imprisoning, and harming those who followed Jesus. He felt that it was his God-ordained mission to route them out of his belief structure, and then he has a transformative encounter with Jesus. It is Paul in his epistle to the church at Rome where he writes something that I want to open with, which is this. Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 14 through 19. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. What is this starting to sound like? It may sound, for those of you who are familiar with the scriptures, the Beatitudes, the preamble to the sermon on the mount. Live in harmony, he says, with each other. Verse 16. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not think you are superior. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And then this key hidden away in verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, wow, he is qualifying this, live in peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, he says, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine, that is God's, to revenge, to avenge, God himself will repay. Now all of this, there is a a recognition, isn't there, that we don't already live in peace with each other. This is tragic. And we shouldn't just gloss over it. We should should just allow it to sit with us for a moment. One of my sermon readers, as I was working through this sermon this week, he sent me a really fun note. He does this every week, which is really great. And he says, yeah, the sermon's fine, you know, good job, thanks Donnell, but what you don't answer is why we are not already at peace with each other. Now, theologians and seminarians and pastors all have answers for that question. They have a clean, easy-to-understand answer. It is a three-letter word, sin. We're all sinners. 
That's why we don't live at peace with each other. Now, of course, they are correct in their assessment of our problem, but I think it's an incomplete assessment of the situation. When we just attribute our active peace-breaking to sin, we can excuse our participation and our responsibility in the breaking of peace. Now, we might turn back to the beginning, the book of beginnings, Genesis, and we see these first humans, they were planted in a garden. God sort of blessed them, told them he would take care of them, and then they decided that they wanted to have what didn't belong to them. They forever condemned us, as it were, to live the rest of our lives in the result of their sin and rebellion. Now, that gives us a beautiful excuse, doesn't it? Because of these first humans who took what didn't belong to them, I am a victim of their actions. I'm not responsible for my participation in their rebellion. It does, doesn't it, Joan? See, we can justify our peace-breaking by saying something along the lines of, well, we're just human. This is human nature. Or better yet, maybe you've said something along the lines of, I'm just a sinner saved by God's grace. Now, all of this is true, of course, but I want to push in here for a moment because I love having arguments with authoritative interpreters who are not present. All right, so (laughs) here we go. Seriously, because, you know, they're already there, and I just feel like this is a bit of a cop-out, actually. This whole idea that because the first humans took what didn't belong to them and started the rebellion, that makes for us an excuse for our peace breaking. You know, some theologians go further than just we are sinners. They say things along the lines of we are totally depraved and wicked, and that's why we break peace. But again, I want to push back on those authoritative interpreters and say that's not who we are. We are the image bearers of the good and beautiful God. When we harm each other, we do so in violation of our actual good nature. We are called to reflect the image of our creator, but when we participate in the rebellion, it distorts our ability to see just how clearly who we are. It gives way to our active participation in peace breaking. Because every time we break peace, we declare something. We say to God, the God of peace, that we don't trust you. We don't believe that God is fair or that we will be treated fair, so that is why we participate in peace breaking. There is an active part of us that says in every act of our rebellion that I reject God's care, God's love, and God's provision for me. It's this part where we say we know better than God. See, I just don't want to give us an excuse to say, well, we're just sinners and this is our nature because that is not true. We are image bearers of the good and beautiful God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says these words, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Now, this passage is plucked from the Beatitudes, the preamble to the Sermon on the Mount, that gives us insight to the kingdom that Jesus is inaugurating in our midst. The Beatitudes announce that the Creator God meets you, redeems you, saves you, and invites you to join Him in His kingdom today, right where you are. A kingdom where he is in charge and where we, his followers, live as citizens in his new world. A new world order in which anger, lust, violence, and peace breaking are abandoned. Now we're invited to live in a kingdom where our enemies are loved 
not hate it, and where the royal law, do unto others as you will have them do unto you, reigns supreme. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be recognized as the children of God. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't explicitly call or command his followers to be peacemakers? Now, you, weren't, you, you, you were following along until I just changed the script a bit. Let me just say that again. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't explicitly command those of us who would follow him to be peacemakers? It's almost exactly how Jesus doesn't teach his first disciples how to pray until they ask him. It's almost as if Jesus is saying something to us, as if he's trying to signal something to us, alert something that we may be missing, which is this, we won't pray and we won't make peace until we recognize and understand exactly who we are and who we belong to. Oh, wait, there's somebody in the room with me this morning. See, this is why I like the, the Wymouth um, translation of this passage, because it shifts the word call to recognize, and it makes it make sense now why he's saying, blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be recognized as those who believe who they are, who they reflect, and who they belong to. See, this Following Jesus thing is not as easy as we want it to be. Because he calls us on our stuff, doesn't he? Forgiveness sits at the boundary of our healing and ultimately our peace. When we are hurt, wounded, and abused, we are faced with a choice. Do we seek peace and create a new story, or do we seek retribution and continue to tell the same old story? Seems easy, doesn't it? Yet it isn't. Forgiveness is not the easy path. Retribution and revenge and retaliation is. As a matter of fact, you actually even feel better when you retaliate. Evolutionary biologists, they lend credibility to this idea by suggesting that we are hardwired to seek revenge. We are hardwired to retaliate when we are harmed and when we are wounded. Don't believe me? Drive. <laughs> Just drive. And if any of you dare to believe you drive better than others, you will know what I mean when I say that revenge, retaliation, is the easier path. How many of you, just between you, me, and your neighbor, have wished for having some kind of brick launcher or vaporizer or something in your car to vanquish those who... Okay, all right. I, I, I'm, I'm talking to some real folks here. Praise God. See, evolutionary biologists posit that this is how we survive when confronted with a threat. You slap me, I slap you harder. You rob me, I burn down your village. But what's missed in all of this is that when I am slapped and I slap you in retaliation, the pain of your first strike doesn't go away. It isn't removed. I may have a, a moment of momentary relief or in, in, uh, just an endorphin release, but it still has the sting there. And the loss of what was stolen from me when you robbed me isn't restored when I burn your village to the ground. See, we engage in what uh, Desmond Tutu in the book of Forgiven call the revenge cycle. And let me just unpack this for a moment. The cycle goes a little something like this. When we are harmed, we decide then not to 
just pause and reflect and figure out how we are in the situation we are, we almost immediately seek to inflict an equal or greater harm to the other in retaliation. Whether we're willing to do it in actuality, we begin to think about it. And so in so doing, what we do is we refuse to acknowledge that the person who harmed us shares in our humanity. And left uninspected, this cycle can escalate. It can escalate with violence or cruelty, which then fuels an endless running of a cycle which they label the cycle of revenge. Now, into this cycle of revenge, Jesus offers another way. Jesus offers another way. You have heard it said, he says, five times in the Sermon on the Mountain, chapter 5 of Matthew. But I say to you, not necessarily a new law, but one that changes the way in which we see the other. In our last sermon series, The God of Second Chances, uh, Nigel and I uh, shared, I offered that the book of Jonah teaches us something important but is often overlooked by us. We have the capacity within us to be both the oppressor and the oppressed. This happens to Jonah when he flees to Tarshish withholding the words of life from the creator God for the Ninevites. Jonah misses the point that God is trying to offer him, which is there is no us versus them. There is only us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be recognized as the children of God. Now, we don't become peacemakers to become the children of God. When we discover that we are all the children of God, it makes it possible to seek the path of peace. This happens because in the midst of the hurt, pain, suffering, and brokenness that we all experience, we're able to see something which is we all share in humanity. There is no other. It's way easier for us to see the other as something else, as someone else. We label those who harm and hurt us maybe as monsters or demons. And when we do that, we deny their ability to change. We take away their accountability for their actions because demons and monsters do not follow a moral order. It excuses their harm and their hurt. It allows us to discard their humanity and say they are worthless. It makes it easy for us to dismiss them and to deny their participation in our shared humanity. Maybe this is why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount not to resist an evil person. Have you read this? You may have skipped it because it can be really difficult when you actually read it and try to put it into practice. Let's read it together. I'm going to read it. You're going to read along, not out loud. But Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but, 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 I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And then he does this really interesting thing. He says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer them the other cheek also. Now, that's an idiom. It's a a coded phrase that's packed into a single sentence, and I just want to unpack it for you for a moment because on the surface, it seems as if Jesus is inviting us to be doormats. He is not. Watch this. In his book, uh, Engaging the Powers, Walter Wink offers an explanation of this passage. You can only be struck on the right cheek by an overhand blow with the left hand or by a backhanded blow from the right hand. 
later, you can try this if you have someone you can practice with, who you have some trust that they will not extend their hands towards you. In the ancient world, social custom prevented folks from using their left hand from striking others. Why? Because the left hand had a special purpose, let the reader understand, and if not, ask me, I'll tell you in the lobby. It was a very personal use, this left hand, uh, in the ancient world. So to strike someone on the right cheek meant you had to backhand them with your right hand. Now, given the social custom of the day, a backhanded blow was a way of saying, I'm superior to you. I'm superior, you're inferior. Because I don't even have to look at you to backhand you. So when Jesus invites us to offer the other cheek, he's deconstructing the social customs of his day. He's saying there is a way, or rather, the only way forward for the aggressor to continue the beating is to do it with an overhanded blow, likely with their fist, which would mean a superior treating an inferior as an equal. Now, in a culture that's built on social standing and strict customs, this was unimaginable. This is why we don't understand it. Because we're just like, whoa, Jesus is just asking us to be slapped around. And anyone who's been slapped, you don't want to be slapped a second time, right? I mean, you're just like, what? Jesus, you're crazy. I am not following you into any narrow gates if you mean that I have to be slapped, right? No, seriously, because that, that's how we read it. We go, man, dude is out of his ever-loving mind. That's because we don't understand what he's trying to communicate. No person of standing would treat an inferior as an equal. Jesus flips the script by telling us to be assertive, not doormats, not aggressive, but assertive. The aggressor can only continue the beating by treating the inferior as a social peer. As Wink puts it, the inferior in effect becomes and starts to say, I am your equal. And I refuse to be humiliated by you any longer. Jesus invites us to join him in his reshaping and reordering of this world by reminding us that the way of peace starts with forgiveness. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, after he does do the Lord's Prayer, he gives us this beautiful nugget of joy. Chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also, if you underline, underline the word also. <laughs> your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And then, watch this in verse 15. Here's that but again. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive you of your sin. <laughs> Do you, now you understand why people don't preach in the Sermon on the Mount. It's just like, there are way better things to talk about. The truth. Here's the truth of forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't so much about the other as it is about us and how we live. If I slap you, I'm going back there again. If I slap you after you slap me, it doesn't lessen the sting I feel on my own face, nor does it diminish the sadness I have because you slapped me. If I retaliate, I choose to enter into violence. I choose to become a violator as well. The only way to experience healing and peace is to forgive. Now, hopefully, all of you have a list of the things that the people who have harmed you in your life have done, and you're holding them as a sign to say, but what about this, Donnell? I'm going to get there. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be recognized as the children of God. Now, when we talk about peace, we tend to think about it in terms of war or fighting. But biblical peace also includes the secession of fighting 
the ending of conflicts and wars, but it also includes loving relationships between individuals, between families, between communities, and reconciliation in our nation, which ultimately leads to reconciliation in our world. Let me just say something about what peace is not. Peace is not the absence of anxiety or trouble. That it is not the absence of anxiety or trouble. Peace is about reconciliation. Peace is about restoration. Peace is about wholeness, fullness, wellness, and health. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace, he says, I give to you. And I don't give as the world gives, he says. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 16, verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then Jesus reminds us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, my friends, I have overcome the world. Peacemaking in our world starts with us right here, right now, in our relationships with each other. We will never see a world at peace until we ourselves are willing to practice making peace by beginning to forgive those who have hurt and harmed us. So what I want to do is just unpack a little bit of how do we actually forgive? Because we're going to be talking two more weeks about forgiveness in different ways, but I just want to give us a framework. And so again, I want to turn to our Advent book, uh, the book of forgiving, as an encouragement for how we can consider making instead of breaking peace. They offer a fourfold process, which uh, if you go online after the sermon, it'll be outlined in greater detail. The first step is telling the story. We get our dignity back as we tell our stories of how we have been harmed. Telling our stories is how we begin to reclaim what has been taken from us and how we start to make sense and meaning of the pain and suffering we're experiencing. The second step is naming the hurt. And you may feel like the telling of the story and the naming the hurt, they're the same thing, but I think they're slightly different in so much that we have to admit that we have been hurt. Many of us who are in relationship with other human beings have been wounded and hurt by somebody. And many of us have been told all over our lives to not make a big deal of the things that have hurt and harmed us. And so we have been conditioned to minimize when we've been hurt or wounded by another. We've been told in our culture to get over things quickly. I was just talking to someone who lost a dear loved one, and a part of the conversation that we got into was all about how long do I grieve? And I remember when we had our first pregnancy end in miscarriage, and I was sitting in my office just crying uncontrollably because I was experiencing grief. I went to my counselor and I said to him, I said, when will the crying stop? And he just sort of patiently sat with me and said, when it's done, and I go, is there anything we can do to move it up so that it can, like, stop faster? And he's like, no, that's not how it works. And I was like, why not? We're smart. Are there drugs? Are there treatments? Like, are there things we can do to make this happen? He goes, uh-huh, it's going through it. I go, that stinks. Actually, I said a different word, but there are kids in today. And I don't want you to say Pastor Donnell told me to use this word, but it really does, right? So we have to name the hurt. A hurt is a hurt. A loss is a loss. Pain is pain. And I have learned from my own personal experiences that when we try to bury the pain and hurt we've experienced, pain and hurt has a way of finding itself to express itself. It's going to come out. And if you don't pay attention to it, it's going to come out in really toxic ways. So when we name the hurt, we break the cycle. This activity allows us to reclaim our dignity and start to construct a new story from the wreckage of the pain and the sorrow of what was lost. Step three, we actually have to grant forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is real. When we choose to forgive, we do so because it's at the center of peacemaking. Forgiveness breaks the revenge cycle, and it allows us to start to tell a new story. Now, let me just say some things about forgiveness. A, forgiveness is not easy. It is not weakness. It does not subvert or override a call for justice. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Let me say that one again. Forgiveness is not forgetting, because you won't forget anyway. Forgiveness is not quick, and forgiveness liberates us. We don't forgive to help the other person. We don't forgive for the other. We forgive selfishly for ourselves. That's why we forgive. Now, the final step in the fourfold process of forgiveness is the hardest one in, uh, for many of us. It's not actually whether or not we would forgive. It's what to do with the person who's harmed us, whether we're going to renew the relationship or release the relationship. That's what we have to do at the end of our forgiveness process. And this is a difficult decision to make because some relationships have to be ended for our well-being and for our safety. Don't hear me at all saying if you're in an abusive relationship and you feel like God is asking you to, um, to forgive the person who's harmed you, that that simultaneously means that God is asking you to put yourself back into that place of abuse. That is not at all anywhere of what I'm talking about. No, not at all. There is a way in which sometimes we have to put an end to those relationships. But in so doing, we don't hold the pain, the hurt, the, the wound, which then breaks us down. Okay? So we're going to talk more about these four steps over the next two weeks if I can figure out how to work them into my sermons. But I wanted to give you what I and uh, the team are talking about when we, when we mention forgiveness. It's a process. Let me finish up by just coming back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be recognized as the children of God. What on earth does Jesus mean when he talks about they will be recognized as the children of God? Where else does this phrase appear? Well, it appears just a little later in the Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, Jesus says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But, man, do it with these buts. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Because God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And in an ancient world, where rain and sun were keys to life. You needed both. You needed both. Jesus is saying something very powerful to us. You have heard that it was said, take sides, but Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies. Move towards the other. If someone has established a line in the sand, move towards them, Jesus is inviting us. Why? Because every act of love establishes the kingdom of God in our midst. The old way encouraged us to take sides. I'm right, you're wrong. This sermon would have been easier if I had just said what I wanted to say in that way as opposed to having a dialogue with those authoritative interpreters who are not present. See, I could just say, I'm right, you're wrong about this. But in fact, I think it's less that. I'm good, you're bad. I'm in, you're out. Taking sides only produces one outcome, friends, the desire to see the other destroyed. Jesus is saying there is no line in the sand. Remember, Romans gives us some insight about who we were. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death on, of his son on the cross, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? God didn't discard us. He didn't just walk away in some sense from us. He tried to make a pathway for us to come towards him. He invites us to join him in this peacemaking process because we become 
the children of God because we learn to see the other the way that God does. That there is no us versus them. That there is only us. See, the opposite of love is not hate. It's fear. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 through 21 say, There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out all fear. For fear has to do with the punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he and this is the word of God, is a liar. I know, it's like, oh, come on, it's Advent. We just talk about Christmas and gifts and, you know, all of that good stuff. The Pope totally messed me up. The Pope said, Christmas is a charade this year. I mean, it's like the Pope, right? You can't have the Pope saying that. It's like, dude, is going to go into early retirement again. It's like another pope going into early retirement. You can't say stuff like that, dude. We're all asleep. You can't wake us up. He says, the world is at war, and Christmas is a charade. I mean, this, this is like a, whoa. Like, dude is actually engaging in the text because he's seeing this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, and remember, you want to define your brother as your relative, right, that you have a disagreement with over Christmas, but go back to Scripture and find out who Jesus defines as your brother. He calls that person your enemy. The story of the Good Samaritan. He says that if you say, I love God, but I hate my brother Jesus, Paul, the Pope, is helping us see that we don't believe what we say. He calls us a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he sees and cannot love God who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. See, when Jesus is serious about something, it's clear. John, who later becomes John the Revelator, before that was John the Disciple. John understands the reality of what Jesus is teaching. The opposite of love is not hate, it is fear. When we have experienced God coming to us, forgiving us, redeeming us, and loving us, it empowers us to do the same. We become peacemakers because we have experienced love from a father who sees us, who knows us, who calls us by name, and who loves us, which frees us to trust him. When we trust God's love for us, it frees us to love the other. It gives us what we need to seek reconciliation in ourselves, in our families. It frees us to seek reconciliation on our jobs, in our communities, in our nation, and ultimately in our work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to have a baptism in just a moment, and I still want to invite you, if you're here this morning, and you want to just declare publicly that you want to throw your lot in with Jesus and you haven't been baptized, baptism is the first step in that process, because in these baptismal waters, you go through something. You go through a death. It's a declaration that you are dying to yourself. The bank will come back. They need to really come back. It's a death to yourself a recognition that you share in the death of Christ. And when you come out of these baptismal waters, it's a recognition that you also share in his resurrection life, which brings us back to life. So if you're here this morning and you haven't, you know, decided to follow Jesus, I want to invite you this morning to consider uh, the step of following him with baptism. We don't have baptism every Sunday. We only do it twice a year, once in Advent and once during Lent. 
And uh, Nigel, who's been moving chairs around with that um, bodacious beard. I don't think Brandy called it bodacious. She called it something else. Her word was better, but I, bodacious was, came out. But uh, uh, Nigel can get you all squared away. I'm going to give us the practical tip. And then uh, during the um, uh, closing worship, we'll do the baptism. So forgiveness is a process. It's a process of letting go. And so the practical tip that I want to give to us this morning, um, and thank you for the time. This was a, a, a longer uh, sermon uh, for me than late just because we had to make our way through some stuff. And so I appreciate your attention as we've been making our way. As we forgive others, I just want to note that we have to release and let go in order to forgive. I mean, that's the only way that we are able to forgive the other. This may mean giving up the right of, to revenge or retribution or retaliation, or maybe even more simply, that you're going to get an, an apology. So my question for you this morning is, and you have somebody that you're thinking of, what's holding you back from forgiving them? What are you waiting for in the other person in order to move towards them and grant forgiveness? What are you hoping for? What are you asking? What are you expecting? I just want to give us a moment this morning to sit with that in your mind. And then what I want to do after we've sat with it for a moment in your mind is I want to invite you, and Julius is going to lead us in communion after Sean leads us in our offering, but hold that thing that you're asking for for the other that is preventing you from offering forgiveness, granting forgiveness. And really, it doesn't matter about the person. It's really about you. And as you come forward for communion, I want to invite you to release it. And you could do it in one of two ways. There's water in this baptismal font that's in front. You can come up and grab, put a little finger in, just a finger, and uh, make the sign of the cross. And as you do that, you can just hold that thing that you're holding and just think of it as being vanquished on Christ's cross. The other way is when you take uh, communion and you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you could offer it to Jesus in that symbol to say, this is the thing that I'm holding, my dad who never expressed his love for me my spouse who betrayed me, my roommate who never cleaned up behind themselves and has now forever condemned me to have to clean up behind others. I just wanted you to laugh. Whatever it is that you're holding, whether it's small or whether it's large, your freedom is here this morning. And I don't want you to leave this space and not go free. All right. I could keep talking, but I'm not going to. Julius or Sean's going to lead us in our offering, and then Julius is going to lead us in communion. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm the roommate that someone <laughs> needs to forgive. So, <laughs> all right, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take our offering now, and so this is the time to put money in the offering bags as they go by, and the time to put those. Uh, cards that are in the seat backs in front of you. So there's the welcome card, the giving card, and the prayer card. So why don't we take a few seconds right now and uh, fill those out. Let's pray for the offering now. Jesus, we're thankful for you and everything that you've done for us. And we want to follow you in obedience now and give some of this back, the provision that you've given us. I pray that you would help us to trust you more and more as we give with open hands and expectant hearts, God. And we pray that you would use these gifts to let the hungry be fed, the lonely be comforted, to bless those that are in need. And may you be greatly trusted and praised as we give. We ask this in your name. Amen. Let's stay seated as we take our offering and we'll sing out the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creation.
creatures here below praise him above you heavenly host praise father son and holy ghost amen glad you all could be with us this morning, and a special warm welcome to any of our newcomers. We want to let you know that our communion table is welcome to all, so feel free to come down and celebrate with us. Our communion meal comes inside a cup, inside of a cup, with the bread on the bottom cup, and the fruit of the vine in the top cup. If you require a gluten-free option, that'll be available here on my right, just be sure to ask for that. Let us stand for communion. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood is to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. It is because of the Prince of Peace that we come together today at the Lord's table in unity and share in the body and the blood. Sacrificed for us for reconciliation with one another and with a loving Father. And we unite our voices and pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come down to communion in two rows down the center. Lose. 
Right. Oh, my, my, hallelujah, His love has lifted me. Oh, my, my, His love has lifted me. As high as the heavens, as deep as the sea, as wide as the river, it's my Savior's love for me. Oh, my, my love is lifted me. Never was a love, never was a love so strong as a love that called my name. Never was a love so fierce as a love that took my shame. Never was a love so true as a love that shed its blood. Never was a love so it's that precious Christian flood. So true, as the love that shed his blood. Never was a love so wild as that precious crimson flood. Lifting me as high as the heavens, as deep as the sea, as wide as the river, as my Savior's love for me. Oh, my, my, His love has lifted me.
joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare in a room. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do that which others claim cannot be done. Bring God's kingdom to earth. Amen. Amen. Have a good week.